Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you here. We're about to go in slowly towards the end of the conference. <laughs> um, but I think we will have an interesting breakout session on our issues of connecting Delta cities here this afternoon because we want to share with you best practices, knowledge, lessons learned from different cities to one another. Um, but before we dive into the cities and what they have to tell and share with us, uh, I would uh, really like to elaborate a little bit on um, why adaptation or that adaptation is becoming more and more important on the agenda of the cities in the world. Um, sorry, just have to check my notes. Um, in the latest um, uh, climate action in mega cities report that was presented yesterday, very uh, extensive by Mr. Mark Watts, uh, we already saw that a lot of action is taking place in, in cities, both on the mitigation and on the adaptation subject. And uh, specifically on adaptation, we see that almost all cities who reported to C40, they think that uh, climate change presents a significant risk to the city, and so they're working on it by, on one hand, allocate staff members. A lot of them have done so already. A lot of cities also have allocated funds for working on adaptation, which is an important thing, of course. And um, a, a vast majority of cities also indicates that uh, they intend to further expand their activities on adaptation uh, the forthcoming years, which is also, I think, an illustration that the network connecting Delta cities really fills in um, maybe a gap or uh, is really fulfilling a need for cities to learn about what to do in times of climate change. Um, before we start with the presentations of the different cities and before I introduce to you the different speakers, I would like to show a short film to you. A short film, it's about Rotterdam, it's only one minute, but in the film are a lot of the questions, a lot of the issues that I think we are all working about. It presents Rotterdam in a lovely way, so if you feel the need to visit our city, please do so. But otherwise, please be inspired by the work we are doing, and you are all doing, and we are all doing. And directly after the short film, Mr. Arnoud Molenaar, the manager of the Rotterdam Climate Proof Program, he will elaborate on the network of connecting Delta cities. What does it mean? What cities are in there, etc. And then afterwards, I will present to you the, the presentation, presenters from the different cities. So first, let's look towards the film.
Okay, thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Um, just uh, fr from my side, a few a few uh, words about uh, the, the, the connecting Delta cities as a network, uh, and a few few slides about uh, our approach. Uh, how are we doing it uh, in Rotterdam, uh, and what is our role in the in the in the network? Um, well, it, it's all, it's all st started, I think, in 2008, um, uh, where uh, well, the, the f actually the first C40 adaptation event was was organised, and uh, cities were, were asked to um, come up with uh, ideas for uh, cooperation between cities. And there, the idea was launched of this uh, connecting Delta City network. We recognised there were, were a lot of uh, similar topics uh, to to exchange between coastal and Delta cities. Um, and to make a, a long story short, this is the map uh, right now of, of, the, of the network. So uh, we, we, the orange spots are the uh, so-called board members and already now more than 10, 10 uh, cities are interested to join uh, the network. So within the coming months we will uh, start uh, talking about these, about these uh, and with these uh, cities. Um, on the right hand side you see well the, the schematic um, um, uh, um, picture of the, the board and you, you can read for yourself who is uh, in it. Uh, on the left hand side just uh, a visualization of how we are organized uh, more or less in each city. Each city has a local government, each city has, is working uh, closely to, uh, together with uh, knowledge institutes but also with uh, private uh, partners and consultancies etc. Um, and, and that's more or less the same in each city. So now it's a G2G network, a government-to-government -government network. Um, but we, what we are trying to organize and uh, also to activate this knowledge layer. So to let these knowledge institutes in all these cities also work together. Um, and it, and it, it, it would be very nice when students in all these cities could work on the challenges which are uh, there in our, in, our, uh, uh, in our Delta cities and coastal cities. Um, and about the position within the, the C40 network, it's, it's um, well, the, the CDC is the oldest uh, sub-network within, within uh, the C40, uh, especially uh, on, on, uh, within the context of adaptation. Um, and we think uh, this network is, is, should really focus on the, on the whole issue of adaptation and uh, focus on the integrated uh, approaches, uh, for example, the climate adaptation strategies. Um, in the meantime, the risk assessment uh, subnetwork has, has uh, arised, uh, but also cool cities and maybe some others. And, uh, well, to our opinion, it's good to have these subnetworks all working on uh, parts of the adaptation, uh, uh, closely working together and exchange uh, things. On the right-hand side, you see some topics that were uh, on the list of, of the Connecting Delta Cities. Um, so high on the list is uh, green infrastructure, uh, uh, community resiliency, um, and, well, and the implementation of strategies and, uh, and financial arrangements. That's our, I think, for the coming months and, and uh, in our plan, uh, that should be important topics. Um, well, uh, there is a variety of activities organized by, by, by the network. We try to, to travel not that, that much. Uh, so that's why we are using events like this, and, and it's, we are all here, so let's, let's, let's uh, uh, come together. <clears throat> Another opportunity will be the Delta Conference in September, so that's an, uh, again a good occasion. In the meantime, we're working on a, what we call the midterm action plan about the activities uh, uh, for the year 2014 and 15. Within a few weeks, we hope to send you the, the draft so we, we, you, you all can, uh, can have a look at it. Um, but we also uh, pu publishing books, and uh, as the mayor of Rotterdam announced uh, in the plenary session, we just uh, finished uh, the third book. Uh, and uh, in this book, uh, 13 uh, uh, Delta cities uh, wrote a chapter. We have a, a few spare ones uh, there uh, at the, in the corner, so if, you're, if you want one, you have to hurry <laughs> and to run to the desk. Um, let me go on. Well, and, and what's Rotterdam doing in, in this uh, Connecting Delta Cities? But there, it's good to notice that there are a lot of cities also working on a bilateral uh, uh, base. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's good that, and, um, to see this. It's also something that we want, would like to stimulate. Uh, uh, cities cooperate with each other. Some start projects and programs. And this is an example uh, how we work together with New Orleans. We assisted New Orleans with some advisories, uh, so some advisors uh, to work on their integrated uh, urban water, uh, water management plan. Cedric uh, Grant will elaborate more on this, I'm sure. Uh, and another, another example is Ho Chi Minh City. Um, 
uh, and after one year they also had their climate adaptation strategy. Um, well, a few words about what are we doing in the city. We, uh, quite recently we uh, finished uh, and launched uh, and got approved by the City Council the Rotterdam Climate Adaptation Strategy. Um, and I'm not going into, into de detail of it, but it's all on the site and we, I have a brochure with me, etc. I'll just pick out one thing and, and that's, that's uh, that w one principle is what's coming out of this strategy is that we are used to work with the traditional solutions, uh, uh, technical solutions, and to use the, the robust system that we have of uh, uh, sewer system and dikes. And that's, that's, that's good, that's really what we should on keeping do. Um, doing, um, but we are adding a new layer of uh, s smaller solutions uh, combined with spatial planning uh, in the public area, but also uh, related to sometimes to, to, to private areas, uh, for example, with respect to uh, green roofs. Uh, so it's a matter of, on a large scale, implementing a lot of small scale solutions. Um, well, just very briefly, and to support this implementation, we developed uh, several uh, tools from, uh, from a, a serious game, uh, so people can under get an understanding of uh, uh, what's adaptation about, and, a, and an understanding of their role, uh, and a cost-benefit ana analysis, a climate atlas, etc. Um, but it's, it's not, uh, the implementation is, is, is not beginning right now. We, we are already for, for several years uh, active with the so-called no regret measures. We have a, a, a lack of water storage, so we know what to do. And from, well, the development of rowing courses, uh, 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 which also serve as, as a water storage uh, facility, up to green roofs and uh, uh, adaptive waterfront development, it's, 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 it's all there. But they all have one thing in common, and that's, that's um, that they are always, they should be multi-functional uh, uh, and always add quality to the city. That, that's our philosophy. When we uh, uh, take measures with respect to adaptation, it, 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 it should be, uh, make the city more attractive. Um, well, and, and, and this more or less is the phase that we are in now. It's, uh, we, we, we have invested in a lot of measures, uh, um, like the green roofs and the water plazas, but th these are well what we see uh, on a scale of objects, but now we have to, to, to upscale it and to, uh, and to work district-wise. We think, uh, we, we picked out this, this district uh, with the abbreviation ZOHO, um, and, and that's, uh, we, we want to make this the first uh, uh, climate resilient uh, di district in the, in, in the city. Um, and the further and the step afterwards is to upscale it. So from object to district to the whole city, from from well each city garden to the streets to the storm surge barrier, the whole city has to become a climate resilient uh, uh, city. Um, well, and the, the, the final sheet is just to give you a, a, a few lessons learned, uh, what I would like to share with you. Um, we, we we think an integrated strategy. Uh, like we have developed in several other cities, is, is, is a really strong starting point um, um, to know where to take your measures, but also to um, start the, 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 the talks and the negotiations with a lot of stakeholders that uh, should be involved in getting your, your, your city uh, resilient. Um, and we are used, again, in investing in robust and technical sound solutions, but we also well, to, to develop and to regenerate the sponge function of the city, we should um, um, invest in flexible solutions and in more ecological sound solutions, if possible. Uh, and again, to work in a, a district-wise um, um, uh, way, we think that's important. Um, and, well, not, maybe not surprising, but it's, it's always important to try to get um, uh, the public, uh, people uh, uh, living around uh, several areas where you're going to take a measure, like this water, water square, uh, get them involved in time and let them think with you about the design of, of, su of, such, a, of such a measure. And last but not least, you all are invited in our uh, Delta Conference September, where you can hear a lot of this, this stuff about adaptation in, uh, in coastal cities, Delta cities and deltas. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Arnaud, for introducing us into the network and into the subject of adaptation, because I'm very sure that we will see a lot of the topics that you touched upon. We will see them also in the presentations from the two cities we have here today. Uh, so let me 
uh, introduce the speakers to you. At first, we will have a presentation from the city of Jakarta. Uh, Mrs. Sarvo Hadanyani, our deputy governor of the city of Jakarta, will tell us all about what Jakarta is doing in the adaptation field. After that presentation, Mr. Alec Nixon uh, from the Greater London Authority will comment on what he has seen in the presentation from Jakarta from a London perspective and compare where there are similarities, differences, etc. Then after that, we will, I, I will be happy to introduce you Mr. Cedric Grant, uh, Deputy Mayor from the city of New Orleans. Of course, a city where it is obvious, just like Jakarta, that adaptation is very important and Mrs. Krishna Milne from the city of Melbourne will comment on that presentation. So without further ado, may I ask Ibuyani to the stage and to present your story from Jakarta. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here in the C40 Cities Mayor Summit to present, thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here in this C40 Cities Mayor Summit to present my city Jakarta experience in dealing with climate change issue, particularly in the adaptation approach and strategies, and I would like to begin the presentation by explaining a quick overview of Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia. With a land area of only 662 Two square kilometer, Jakarta is home to almost 10 million people in the night time and 12 million people in the daytime. Jakarta has many roles. It is a capital city and also a national activity center for economic, business, tourism, and also diplomatic activities. You have probably heard the news recently that some region in Indonesia were hit by natural disaster, such as a volcanic eruption in North Sumatra, flood in Jakarta and some part of Java coast, North Coast, flash flood and landslide in North Sulawesi, extreme weather and high tide in the eastern Indonesian waters, and last time 6.5 Richter scale earthquake Shak Central Java. The disaster have caused damage to building, loss of life, and thousands of people evacuated. Not to mention the economic impact of the disaster that is estimated to be a billion of dollars. Global climate change is believed to be one of the triggers of unpredictable and extreme weather phenomenon that occur in some part of the world especially in the Jakarta, where the population density and economic activity is high, the impact and loss is multifold. Among 30 rivers traversing Jakarta, Chiliwung is the biggest, with upstream catchment in Bogor region. During the recent flooding in January, the highest rainfall intensity in the upstream are caused the highest flow in Chiliwong River of 420 meter cubic per second. This resulted in, in addition in some of the built up areas in the inner city along the river bank and nearly 22,000 inhabitants were displaced from their homes. If we look at the origin of the problem, upstream deforestation change in land use, increase of population, as well as illegal settlement along the river, river banks have caused a significant burden to the environment. We also have issues of land subsidence in North Jakarta with an average of 
7.5 cm per year, as well as a rise in sea level. The situation puts Jakarta at high alert and the, the issue of climate change and adaptation has become the nation's priority and documented in the national and regional development. This slide shows schematic concept of Jakarta urban water management. It evolves around the concept of one river, one plan, one management. Rainfall in the upstream and higher land will flow by gravity to the river and retention lakes outside Jakarta, still in Bogor. Measures to minim minimize runoff is by reforestation, construction of infiltration well, and development of new lakes. At low-lying areas, water is collected in polders and pumped to river or major drainage system. Several rivers, sh shortcuts and diversion are also planned, such as in interconnection of Chilibung River to East Flat Canal, this in, in Jakarta City. Drainage capacity improvement is done through dredging and river widening. It, at the coastline, sea walls with gates are constructed to protect North Jakarta from tidal flood and overtopping of tide. In terms of adaptation approach, there are two adaptations with regard to urban flood mitigation. The first being integrating flood management with urban spatial, spatial planning. The idea is to promote waterfront urban development, thus increasing sense of belonging to the waterways and multifunction development of urban water body. We are also planning to add water body ratio by acquiring the low-lying areas and turning them into lakes or reservoirs. The second approach involves integrated planning of green and blue infrastructure such as river improvement and development of green belt along river bank. Here are examples of adaptation effort that the city has started. The Chiliwung River improvement is a joint effort between Central and Jakarta government. There are thousands of households household living in slum area along the river bank. The plan is to widen the river and the settlers will be relocated to subsidized apartment provided by the government. The other one is the 18 hectare reservoir in Pluit, uh, which is Pluit, is one of the vital flood control infrastructure in Jakarta that serves a total catchment area about 2,083 hectares. Last year, Nearly 40% of the reservoir was covered with water hyacinth and heavily sedimented. Squatters living on the edge have also significantly reduced the capacity. The reservoir is now being revitalized through dredging and resettlement of squatters. The other one is located in the heart of East Jakarta, Ria Ria Lake, 28 hectare, was highly polluted with squatters occupying the sedimented lake. The concept of development involves around integrating high quality and diverse landscape development with flood control infrastructure. Project affected people will be relocated to low cost apartment. And this slide uh, shows us the city has set up five major infrastructure project initiatives aimed to mitigate urban flood with the assistance and coordination with central government and adjacent provinces and regions. The first initiative is to retain the water in the upstream of Chiliwung River by building Chiawi and Sukamahi Dam. It's around 100, more than 100 hectares. The land acquisition will start this year. 
The second initiative is to divert water volume by building a connection to Cisadana River in the neighboring province of Banten. It's in the west of Jakarta. The third initiative is to divert water volume by construction a connection to East Flat Canal, which will start this year. The fourth initiative is to improve the performance of polder system in North Jakarta by constructing new reservoirs and reten retention, retention ponds. And the last initiative is to as the construction of offshore sea dike. The coastal protection will be developed in an integrated manner with 5,100 hectare reclamation plan and urban revitalization of North Jakarta. The long-term adaptation plan is known as the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development. Through this plan, we will be able to turn the challenges we are facing into new development opportunities. We are planning to develop sea defense walls, which will lead to, to new land reclamation, raw water reservoirs, road and railway network, and port development. Ladies and gentlemen, the adaptation plans I mentioned earlier request stakeholder commitment and support. Central government, adjacent province, and region must work together to solve the urban flood issues. We need to have the same vision to realize the concept of one river, one plan, one management. This effort, of course, is, is not easy task. Moreover, we have to involve communities, private sector, and NGO, which makes it more difficult. With regard to major infrastructure projects that require huge investment, such as the sea defense wall, we are considering several funding options since this is a new project for us, we also need expert advice from all over the world to help us finalize this plan. We would like to thank to the Kingdom of Netherlands for their support in this matter. Fellow delegates, the governor of Jakarta, inspirational leadership and negotiation capability, has helped improve communication between the government and the people, especially when it comes to social issues, planning to infrastructure project implementation. Jakarta has seen example of people relocating to a proper housing voluntarily, and their current condition is proven to be better. This has been an emphasis for the Jakarta government in program implementation with less public resistance. And lastly, a consistent law enforcement should be maintained in order for the government to gain more support and trust from the people. Only with the consistent plan and law enforcement can we realize the vision of a safe, convenient, productive, and sustainable Jakarta. Thank you. Thank you, Ibuyani. I think you showed us in your presentation the real urgency and complexity of uh, the adaptation process and program in a city like Jakarta. And you also made it very clear that when you work on water management issues, you cannot do that without looking into other sectors like housing and things like that. And it would be very interesting to hear now from Mr. Alex Nixon, from Alex Nixon, from his London point of view. Um, what his comments are on the strategy that Jakarta has taken and whether he has some very good advice, maybe, for the city of Jakarta. May I ask you to come to the stage, please? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Nixon. I work uh, for the Greater London Authority. My official job title is uh, Policy and Programme Manager for uh, Resilience and Quality of Life. Essentially, my job is to make sure that we make London resilient so when we have our Sandy or our 
extreme weather event, we are rough and tough and we can bear it out with, uh, with minimum hassle. I have to say it's, it's very worrying when I look at the number of uh, connecting Delta cities that have had their extreme weather event or more. In recent years, London is starting to become one of the few that hasn't had it. Uh, and therefore, you know, really, we've got to learn from the real experience of those cities. You know, New York, Melbourne, Jakarta, the list just rolls on. We've got to learn from those who have actually, you know, faced the tide, faced the storm, and are now rebuilding, um, rather than from our position of not actually really being tested. Um, I want to thank the Connecting Delta Cities for this opportunity. Obviously, being constructively critical of another city's plans is never easy. But that's one of the beauties of this partnership is the fact that, you know, we are, for a long time, we seemed a bit like the climate resilience resistance. You know, C40 was very focused on mitigation, and now I think we're starting to see a really true commitment to adaptation and balancing adaptation with mitigation. And I think this is not before time and to be entirely welcomed. Um, I wanted to start off by comparing and contrasting the two cities. So uh, both Jakarta and London are compact, dense cities. Uh, Jakarta is more compact and more dense than London. I think you know, our, our, our um, daytime population in about 10 years' time will equal yours. Um, but you, know, you are squeezing more people into a much smaller area. Um, we are both at the bottom of an extensive catchment. So what happens upstream uh, really affects us downstream. And so we have to work well with our neighbors in order to ensure that things happen. Uh, and you know, the, the culture of moving water quickly downstream has started to change, but is a real challenge for both cities. Um, both of our cities are bisected by rivers, who uh, once provide the, you know, the, 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 the attraction for development, but also provide a significant risk. Um, and both of us are facing extraordinary growth. Uh, London, we're predicting to grow by about 3 million more people over the next 30 years. So even without climate change, just our current population and our aging assets present a significant challenge to keeping the city safe. But when you add climate change on top, you really cannot use the past as a guide to the future. Uh, and so some uh, very impressive work there. Um, and so, as I say, even without climate change, we, were, we face challenges. However, Jakarta faces some challenges that I'm very glad not to face. I mean, your rate of subsidence of 75 millimeters a year is 12 times what London faces. We are sinking by about one and a half millimeters a year, uh, and the, uh, we reckon sea levels are going up by about four and a half millimeters a year. So at six millimeters, we are one twelfth of your truly scary tw two to four meters over 20 years subsidence. That would really scare me. Um, and also, we don't have to face unofficial settlements. The complexity of, of dealing with people who are have forced to live in areas of very high risk, but at the same time, where you need to be implementing your adaptation actions along the river banks. Uh, and so on. So, and we certainly don't have seismic activity. Well, we do, but nothing, nothing on the scale of 6.5 on the Richter scale. So, uh, I salute you. You really make my day job look quite easy by comparison. So, I, I wanted to just, you know, to, to comment on your on your adaptation plans. Your, uh, I have to say, your one river, one plan, one management scheme is bang on international best practice. Uh, you know, we are all looking at integrated catchment management, trying to manage water where it falls and where you have place and space to be creative with it, to manage and hold that water so by the time it gets down to the city, you've reduced the volume and the rapidity of it. Uh, and this, is, this requires massive partnership working. It's something we in the UK are now struggling to deal with, and we are not bringing those partnerships together uh, you know, at the rate we really need to. So you know, that, that is absolutely brilliant. I mean, the Dutch call it making room for rivers. We call it making space for waters. You're calling it getting on and doing it. So I was I'm very impressed with that. Um, I also thought that um, I was very impressed by your commitment to keep people's connection with the water. Uh, for me, the first step of, of, of flood risk uh, management is to keep people recognizing that water is there and it is good. Uh, I think the pro when, as soon as we start to build very significant walls and we make the population turn their back on the water, then they become more uh, oblivious to the risk from it. Um, however, by being creative with how you develop alongside your water spaces, um, you can maintain that connection with the river, um, but also uh, high quality development alongside the riverside can fund the actual high costs of, of, um, of flood risk management. But again, uh, I was very impressed with your commitment to use green infrastructure to complement heavy gray, in, gray infrastructure engineering. Because uh, certainly in London, we found that using re what we call retired flood defenses, but naturalized riversides, um, are about a third of the cost of driving in steel piles. Uh, and they have you know, the capacity for you to be able to upgrade them much cheaper in the future. 
So again, uh, you know, totally endorse that approach and think that breaking your rivers out of their concrete constraints, who, who simply move the flood risk down and accentuate it down the river, is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, one thing in London we have worked extensively on is this concept of flexible adaptation pathways. The idea that we don't really know what the future looks like, so what you need to do is to test a wide range of scenarios. So, for example, in the River Thames, um, we suspect river levels might go up between one and two metres by the end of the, the century. Uh, we've even tested to four metres of sea level rise. We know that once we get above 4.2 metres, there's nothing we can do. The river will simply flood around the back of London. So we'd have to build a wall all the way along the east coast of England to protect ourselves. But what we've been able to do with our environment agency is look at what are the different portfolios of measures that can protect against one meter, two meters, three meters, four meters, and look at when in time you may need to deliver them. So right now we, we, we presume, we think uh, sea level rise is gonna be one meter, but we know what we would need to do for two and four meters, and we know when we would need to start doing it. So by measuring the sea level rise against the projections, we then know, right, we've got to kick into plan B now, and we need to start it now, because we know it'll take 30 years to deliver. Um, so that's, that's one thing I would certainly endorse you. Um, but I have to say, I totally applaud your, your multifaceted plan. Um, I think all leading, leading cities now, of which the connecting Delta cities is probably the best example of, uh, are moving from understanding to delivery. And that delivery is ever more difficult, particularly in the financial constraints we have at the moment. I mean, I, certainly I know every project I try and get funding for, I have to compare against, well, how much, what is its payback period? And at the moment, we don't have a, pay, we don't have a, a value for a ton of adaptation. I think we know what a, what, a, what a lack of adaptation does. Too many cities have experienced what a terrible flood costs their city. But you know, for the cities that haven't been affected yet, it's very difficult to put a price on what that resilience is truly worth. Um, and therefore, we are constantly competing with fund my adaptation program versus fund my carbon program. I think we've got to crack that and fund both. And this is an ideal network to do that. Um, we also face the, uh, the challenge of how do you raise awareness and maintain awareness of a population that is often selectively oblivious. It is human nature not to want to think about bad things. When you are told bad things, to try and translocate the blame onto someone else. And again, I think we were hearing from New York in a session this morning, they've got the unvariable task of telling people, you live at flood risk, but there are things you can do. Um, and lastly, uh, I just wanted to say thank you again for this opportunity, and I hope we can have some really good discussion at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your, I think, inspiring comments. And I don't think it's only inspiring for Jakarta, but I think for all of us. Uh, let's now move quickly towards New Orleans, from the east to the west. Mr. Cedric Grant, may I give you the floor and tell, you, tell us everything about New Orleans? I will tell you what I can in 15 minutes. Um, I'm Cedric Grant, Deputy Mayor for Facilities, Infrastructure, and Community Development. The mayor um, created that, that vast title for me with a simple charge. I was the person that was put in charge of the recovery from Katrina uh, when we took office. So uh, I had to aggregate several functions that we historically had had in separate portfolios all under my uh, direction to, to get this recovery underway. Um, I'll jump right into the presentation because it, it will help me explain much of what I do and how we're, we're doing it. New Orleans is, is one of those unique Delta Delta places. We are constructed to sit atop of wetlands and silt soil, cross sections with canals to have the water move through the city to drain into the lake and have our neighborhood situated on top of it. We sit between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain at um, our highest point, 1.5 feet below sea level. Without the benefit of gravity, maintaining a safe and sustainable balance among stormwater, surface waters, and groundwaters must be engineered in New Orleans to, to work. Uh, we average, on, on average, 63 inches of rainfall a year. We're the third wettest city in the United States. We're in the Mississippi Delta. We're about 363 square miles, and we have 380,000 people uh, as we rebuild from Katrina. Our problems and challenges that we're facing certainly deal with flooding, subsidence, and water assets wasted. And we use the opportunities to improve the safety, economic vitality, enhance 
quality of life. What I w would like to tell you about that is that um, in order to do that, we have, uh, short of the Netherlands, one of the most significant drainage systems in the world. Um, our drainage system has a cap capacity to drain one inch of rain during the first hour of a storm and a half inch for every hour after that. Um, that becomes significant to you when you understand that we've had three 500 year floods in the last 10 years and that's not counting Katrina. So the damage is significant it, it, uh, to property, um, eco economic growth and development and, and the like. So we, we are quite serious about how we manage those risks. Uh, what have we learned in this? We've learned that we now have to create this one water solution for more sustainable and resilient New Orleans that complicates, that complements our water infrastructure investment and by aligning our governance structure and policy and funding, harnessing public spaces to safely retain water and recharge the sinking soils, and leveraging water investment to spur economic growth and development. Uh, and in that harnessing opportunity, we really are trying to now find ways to safely detain stormwater and recharge our sinking soils. Much of the infrastructure that we built in the past with this pumping system did just the opposite. It caused the subsidence by taking the water out of the soil, and we're now trying to reverse that. But as we do this water detention and retention, we are in the subtropical climate, so we now have to be very careful about the thing that we, the reason we built the system to begin with, which was to, um, to allay fears for the yellow fever epidemics that we had experienced back in the, 18, the late 1800s and 1900s. That, that, cause for the system to be built. Um, out of that is, quite honestly, we've, we happen to have one of the most significant mosquito control operations in the world, and they have now become a part of my team that is helping me with biological answers to water retention, to, to help me find those kinds of things that we can put into the water system that help us uh, um, deal with the mosquito population and, and other, other vectors that have caused us infinite problems in the past. Uh, to create the one water solution, what you see here is a picture of one of our pumps. Um, our pumps are some of the most significant in the world. They were designed by an engineer from New Orleans uh, to specifically serve New Orleans. The technology uh, was 19, uh, 20, early 20th century technology has been imported around the world, but um, it, it is the thing that keeps us safe. But in that, we've had decades of deferred maintenance funding, inconsistent system-wide strategic planning, and multiple government entities maintaining and managing various aspects of, of our water system. So what we've taken the opportunity to do is improve that framework um, by making a major investment in sewer and water infrastructure. Uh, re last year, our city council passed a 10-year rate increase for sewer and water improvements in order to help us get after this program. We enacted governance reform legislation that has changed the governance of our sewer and water authority. And we are in, in the process of completing a complete re revamp of our comprehensive zoning ordinance that for the first time we'll have a stormwater management um, section that will have zoning and permitting regulations that will allow us to, to manage um, the system well. To get after this in, in the public spaces, as I said, we've, we've, we're about to embark on this major upgrade of sewer and water and drainage systems. In order to do that, we're going to do it by beginning to implement green infrastructure. Um, we've started some pilot projects that are allowing us to take, um, as you can imagine, post-Katrina, for all the population that we've, 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 we've gotten back, we have some 45,000 empty lots in, in New Orleans. And some people will never return. So some of those have been uh, deeded over to the government, and we use them now to create swales and open park space, and we're going to use them for detention. And as we take the, the, the properties out of commerce. And here's an example of one of those that's in the middle of a neighborhood. We've just created it. Um, we're, in fact, today, the mayor is dedicating this, this project with the EPA administrator in, in New Orleans. And so we've um, begun this, this kind of work. And it, this is an outgrowth of another strategy that we came to in our water, one water solution, which was to begin to try and create a one water plan. And so we worked with uh, various stakeholders, our Economic Development Agency, the GNO Inc., and others to create the Urban Water Plan that identifies short and long-term pilot projects and economic development strategies to increase community access and private sector investment surrounding water and green infrastructure. These small things that we think we can do uh, can also be complemented by some larger opportunities that we, we hope to, to, to 
put it in place as a result of the water plan. So you, here's where you can find that water plan that we've just implemented. Um, we, we think it's the thing that's going to help us uh, get through the future. We will be spending over the next uh, 10 years some $3.5 billion in reinvestment in our sewer water and drainage system as a starting point on this. The urban water plan calls for another $6 billion of investment in, in major uh, infrastructures of greening, of uh, water retention and detention, and, and other strategies that we, we think are going to help make us successful. So in that light, what we would, would say to you is that we're well on our way. Um, as I tell people uh, often, we are now going to spend some time writing down what we've done because we've spent the last 10 years doing it. Um, we had no choice but to get after the, the, the plan of putting our city back in place, putting our city, um, making it whole again. Um, we went from a, a decrease in population of about 75% to now being the fastest growing city in America. Uh, we are averaging eight to 10,000 people returning per year as a result of the fact that they now feel safe. There's a $14 billion um, system of, of dikes and levees that has been put in place by the Corps of Engineers that has helped us do that. We believe these internal strategies that we've talked about here today will give us the other piece of the puzzle that allows us to, to, to continue to live in this wonderful place we call home, um, this very unique place. But as you can see, just like the rest of Delta City is this dangerous place that, um, as I tell people all the time, maybe 300 years ago we would not have decided to build a city here. But we did, and <laughs> we've made it this wonderful place. So thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Grant, for uh, telling us about New Orleans. Uh, there was one term in your presentation that, that struck me really, which was water-based community development. And I think that really indicates what it's all about. Uh, it's not only about technological solutions. It's really about involving your communities, your people, and you need communication with your people to be able to implement things like green infrastructure, uh, complementing the gray ones. May I now ask Mrs. Krishna Mill from the city of Melbourne to comment from a, on a whole other part of the world on what is going on in New Orleans. Krista? Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to reflect on uh, New Orleans presentation. Congratulations to um, your city and your leadership for um, having such a fantastic response to a very um, challenging event for the city. Um, it was really fantastic to, to hear about the plans. And I'm going to reflect by starting with, uh, um, Alex mentioned Melbourne has had its um, share of some extreme weather events. And what's interesting is they've been a very, very different extreme weather events to yours, but in some ways some of the solutions have ended up with similar, similar strategies. So um, many of you may have heard about the 2009 bushfires that Melbourne experienced where 140 people lost their lives um, uh, with an extreme firestorm that surrounded outer Melbourne. But what many people don't, didn't hear about that event was actually 400 people lost their lives in the lead up to um, the, the bushfires from extreme heat in the city. Um, and that also came, that event came at the end or towards the end of an extreme drought that um, Melbourne and Victoria and many parts of Australia were suffering when we'd had 10 to 12 years of very low rainfall. Um, and so this is where the stories, I guess, are very different. We were suffering from a lack of water and um, uh, Melbourne was actually at risk of running out of water. I'm a major city in Australia and we were very close to running out of water from a drinking supply perspective. And that was having also a big impact on the city and the, the plants and the parks and the, and the trees and which is then contributing to the challenge of heat in the city. So um, I guess the, the, the approach that the city has taken uh, to, to start to deal with that problem, I guess, was a wake-up call, and that was our first real thinking of, well, adaptation. You know, Australia's had droughts all through its history, but it was such an extreme drought that was really, we started to look at the science and realising that uh, drought is actually going to be part of our future and we need to build resilience um, in the city to that, experi to that, um, that uh, experience. And that's where I guess water and localised water solutions came in and um, 
we started as a city saying we need to catch everything that falls on the ground. So different to your experience where you're dealing with water in the environment constantly and then this extreme event to work out how do you actually deal with that um, and respond to that and be resilient to the, that. But we had a problem of not enough water and needing to catch everything um, that was happening. So we've been investing significantly in stormwater facilities, um, capturing uh, in our public parks uh, to enable us to build some resilience and have some independence from those um, uh, uh, extreme uh, droughts and weather events. Uh, and to enable us to continue to cool our city. We also um, have a fantastic uh, uh, population of street trees that are really important in reducing the heat in our city. But one of the, the risks, um, the issues with the reduced, um, sorry, the drought in, in Melbourne was that we actually reduced the amount we were watering those. And those, those trees, a imp very important part of the asset, um, of the city's assets, uh, uh, their lives have been shortened and now we've uh, got a significant challenge in terms of maintaining and enhancing our urban forest. So we need water to do that. Um, the other part of our, I guess, our climate adaptation story is that while we have reduced rainfall, we will get extreme weather, um, storm events, extreme and flooding, as well as sea level rise. And when that happens, we have sea level rise with a king tide and an extreme downpour, then we do have similar situations um, to what you talked about, not quite so extreme, and in New Orleans and the Katrina event, but we do have um, issues with major storm events. So we're now moving to the similar strategies and I really commend you on your plans, the integrated approach of um, water sensitive design uh, uh, and green infrastructure to deal with those, those extreme events, but connecting that into the community benefit, the health and wellbeing of the community and um, economic uh, benefits from those that um, enhancing the environment. Um, so, uh, and I guess the other aspect that is really um, a strong parallel to the work that Melbourne is done, doing and you are doing is, is rethinking the governance structures uh, that are necessary to manage um, a city in an environment with, uh, with uh, uh, a changing climate. And uh, so Melbourne, our state government is, is spending a, a, um, a lot of effort doing regional planning around water management. Uh, and looking at the various responsibilities that um, the city uh, and uh, government are taking and how they're tackling that challenge collectively and doing integrated land use planning um, uh, to, to build into the development approach, uh, how the private sector need to be involved to build water sensitive um, developments and all those aspects. But it, most importantly, not, not forgetting the opportunity of involving the community, and that was certainly cl coming out clear that um, that's been a, a big focus of New Orleans. So I think I'll leave it there and um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, well, that for, for, for this moment, that was all about our presentations and our comments, but we still have time, so... Um, I think that it's a good time to start discussions, make remarks and comments, and I would like to ask the presenters and the commenters to take a seat on the stage. Um, and they have a microphone for answering questions. And maybe, maybe um, I would like to give the floor first to another Delta City, which is part of our Connecting Delta Cities network, Mr. Noritaka Sanada from Tokyo, and give him the opportunity to comment from, again, a whole different part of the world on what he has heard so far and whether, uh, and what his comments are on the approaches he's seen. He's in the back of the room and he will comment, and his comment will be translated into English right afterwards, so you don't need a headset. Mr. Sanada, may I ask you to make your comment? So, uh, good afternoon. My name is um, Sanada. I'm from uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Thank you very much for the opportunity for me to be able to make some comments on this uh, wonderful presentation today. Uh, 
So I was uh, really uh, impressed and inspired by both of the presentations that's been just presented by New Orleans and then also Jakarta. And I have two questions to uh, both of the cities. え、東京都、東京では、え、適応策に関してはこれから本格的に検討する段階に入っております。so in Tokyo at the moment, we have reached the stage where we are going to uh, start taking a full-fledged uh, efforts uh, on the adaptation. え、そこで、え、この適応策という観点で、新たに、え、2つの都市とも、あの、洪水が起きるような、え、地形でありますので、今回この適応策という観点を取り入れたことで、新たに対策を追加したようなことは何でしょうかこれが1点目の質問であります。So um I understand that the both cities New Orleans and Jakarta uh, have a you know geographic um geographic elements where you already have a tendency to have lots of uh, water uh, rainfalls and then also uh, you know which leads to the big flooding and etc. But after you have introduced the adaptation efforts, what is that exactly that you have introduced newly in addition to all the efforts that you have made thus far? え、皆さんご存知の通り、え、気候変動に関するリスクは今後も長期的に増加すると思われます。そこで東京都でも思考的に気候変動による影響を評価調査いたしました。それでこの2つの都市についてその気候変動予測というのはどのくらいされているので
But uh, what happened in Jakarta uh, related with the flood that every year we, we hit by flood is uh, because uh, we were influenced by the upstream region uh, and as uh, I already told you, in the upstream uh, actually is already changed the land use. So the, the water come uh, to, to the downstream is very huge. Uh, and the other, the other thing is uh, also the, the climate change make the, the rainfall is extreme. Uh, and the other one, what Jakarta hit is in the uh, north of Jakarta, land subsidence occur. It's uh, increased every year. And then uh, the water sea level is increased. So the total become uh, more, more uh, bad influence to Jakarta. So uh, we not only uh, consider about the climate change, but also we do the cooperation between region uh, in the upstream. We ask them to make the um, plan, make strict to the land use, uh, land use uh, permit, and also um, make the, the uh, water retention to, to keep the water in the upstream. Maybe that's all. Okay, thank you. Do maybe Melbourne or London want to comment on one or either or both questions? Okay. Um, yes, excellent question. Really good question, well put. Um, what are we doing? <laughs> um, uh, the key thing we're working on at the moment is this, for me the fundamental problem with adaptation is we don't know where we want to be. So with mitigation, we've set a global target of, of, of you know, keeping the planet cool, not you know, hotter than two degrees. We've worked out how much carbon dioxide internationally we need to reduce. Each country's worked out its share. Each sector worked out that is. We've got targets. We're heading towards them. On adaptation, we have no goal. You know, we just don't want to have more of what we've had in the past. So what we're trying to do in London is to define what does the future look like and how do we measure getting there. So if we want risks to be no worse tomorrow than they are today, and climate change is going to make those risks more frequent and more intense, then what is the actual quantum of adaptation we need to do? How much stuff do we need to do? How much green infrastructure? How much bigger pipes? How much more uh, public awareness do we need in order that we can keep the risk uh, the same despite the drivers increasing? So we're looking at a green infrastructure program where we're calculating how much green infrastructure we need to implement every year and every decade in order to keep risk at an acceptable level. Uh, and then looking at how you deliver that through the planning system, through retrofitting buildings, what is the incentive you need to deliver that, um, and how much cheaper and more beneficial is that than, say, building great big tunnels under the city. Uh, with regards to the forecasting question, we're very lucky in the UK. We have the UK Climate Impact Programme, who in 2009 produced, I think, what are still the, the best climate projections in the world. Um, they are scenario-based, and you can, you know, they're, they're very, very, very sophisticated. Uh, and so they give us a high confidence uh, of, of, of what the future would look like and you know, to be able to produce these scenarios against which to adapt. Um, we're actually, though, very poor at measuring our own climate within the city. Um, we had three World Meteorological uh, uh, Organization uh, weather stations, uh, and then we had to shut one of them because someone built an air conditioning plant next to it. So we're now looking at how can we actually measure the climate within the city? Because the urban climate varies hugely across the city, both so we know, you know where are our risk areas, but also we can know, oh, is what we're doing having an impact? And we're look, working with IBM and various others to look at smart technology. Every IFA, every you know, smartphone has more sensors in it than, you know, than probably most of our national weather centers. So can we capture that data and translate it uh, into a way that we don't need to create many more weather stations? Thank you. Yeah, Melbourne, I guess, has a, a similar approach. We, we, in 2009, did a strategic risk assessment um, of all the risks we were likely to face and where we should focus our effort. And some of the things I've talked about it has been our focus. Two particular um, projects or initiatives that I'd like to mention. We're now um, just starting to uh, look at the economic um, assess, doing the economic assessment of our green infrastructure and where we're taking that. And so that's um, aiming to both uh, help us really plan 
for the future and understand the benefit um, of that, that green infrastructure from a broad perspective. So it's really taking adaptation um, initiatives out of that just um, in the climate space and into economic support, economic growth in, in the city and those sorts of things. In the forecasting space, yeah, similar, um, similar challenges. Uh, we have adapted the IPCC climate uh, predictions to Melbourne. Uh, but locally, we've done thermal in imaging across the city, so we know where the hotspots are within the city, and that's where we can focus our effort in terms of our cooling strategies, such as tree planting, um, and also uh, providing that information to people so that they build their own resilience on those hot days using that information. Thank you very much. And although time seems to be running out already, uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions from the audience. Mr. Abu Talib. A question specifically for Melbourne. Um, what I learned in the in, in last year as being mayor is that uh, water management equals special planning. Uh, you may put equal sign between the two statements. What I also learned that we have a, a neighborhood in Rotterdam constructed after the war. Um, it's there where it's minus six meters. And sometimes they joke that the authority is responsible at that time to give building permissions in that area should be brought to justice. Um, stupid, but it happens. And I have been witnessing the fires in, in, in Melbourne. What kind of lessons do you draw from your special planning when it comes to building houses in the forests? Um, I'm going to make an end to that. Uh, what do you do with the remaining houses in these areas, knowing that uh, you are facing in the future maybe same or similar problems with, with fires, lack of water, and um, amazingly, the little water you have is used by the fire department. <laughs> it's really, really uh, interesting. What kind of lessons do you draw from what happens in Melbourne? Yeah, it was a, certainly an interesting um, challenge for the for the community and authorities when that happened and there was a lot of discussion in the in the community about do we build back do we go back into those communities and i guess similar experience to new orleans that there's a lot of emotional and um, investment in those um, in those areas um, what the focus has very much been about building built uh, building resilience back into into the um, into the housing so there are very strong uh, requirements uh, for any houses that are built in bush, bushfire prone um, zones uh, in terms of the, the quality and the, the structural um, protection against bushfires. The other thing that um, the, those communities have um, absolutely transformed in is their own preparedness and planning in that how they respond in an emergency and we've had not, not as anywhere near extreme 2009 levels, but we've had bushfires recently and the communities uh, all had their plan. The um, communication from the authorities to uh, people was seemed to run very well and people knew what their plan was and I guess there's a, a preparedness for this will come, we may, lose, we may lose things, we may lose assets, but at least we protect our lives and we, we've done our best to protect our property. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a great learning, but I think in the end um, there's that investment in in areas, and um, that seems to be pervasive. But it's a great question to continue through as we have to deal with these issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, unfortunately, now we really have run out of time. I see a lot of red zeros in front of me, so I think it's time to wrap up. And I think what we've heard this afternoon from the very interesting presentations and comments and questions is that although the challenges in the different parts of the world and in the different cities sound really different, and then when it comes to how do you find solutions, then you suddenly see a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities in the approach, the way we are thinking, the solutions we are looking for, and the way in which we are working on them. One of the important things that I heard is it's important to look on a long-term perspective and think in scenarios and keep flexibility to adjust when you go along uh, towards your future. And one other important thing that
came into every presentation was the involvement of the people and what they mean and what their role is in becoming really resilient cities and communities. And I think those are challenges we really need to work on together. And some cities already did a lot in that area, others not, so another topic we can, I think, work on together from now on. I would like to thank you for your attendance this afternoon. I would like to draw very briefly your attention to the last slides. You saw the four last slides and this one, which show the websites where you can find all further information, both on the Connecting Delta Cities Network and also on the C40 Exchange site. So if you're looking forward for more information, please turn to the websites. I would like to thank our speakers and our commenters very much for their, I think, inspiring presentations and comments. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you on our, uh, on our mission to make our cities more resilient in the future. So thank you very much and hope to see you all again soon.